Hello again from your host, Tony Baker, as I continue to remember Jano Starker and his music-making legacy with this special presentation in recognition of what would have been Mr. Starker's 93rd birthday on the 5th of this month. What I have for you are some excerpts from a two-hour video shot one evening in Birmingham, Alabama in 1989. Mr. Starker is the guest of honor at this soiree. Mr. Starker will tell you all about what's going on, but before we get started, I must express my deep and sincere thanks to Mr. Starker's daughter, Gabriella, for giving me this treasure. Now sit back and enjoy. Probably all are wondering what's supposed to happen tonight here. So am I. <laughs> it's supposed to be an evening of improvised happening, but with a certain purpose in mind. And the purpose is to try to combine things that happened in the past and it's happening today. Of what is what's happening today, I don't know how many of you have been present in various parts of the world when I perform as a concert artist in halls. How many of you have heard recordings that I make as a cellist? I'm sure some of you yes. have. But some of you may not have known it and are here for some other reason. For those I like to say that I am Janusz Starker and I am what is called a concert cellist. Being a concert cellist means that I travel from one town to another, from one continent to another. Usually to the tune of about 100 concerts a year. And I arrive to a town, eventually either if I play with an orchestra, I have a rehearsal during the day, and I go to sleep, come to the evening to the concert hall, and the stage manager comes up and says, five minutes, sir, two minutes, down, now it's the time that I go on stage, play, hopefully I receive some applause, <laughs> and after the concert, in most instances, there is a reception. In the reception, I meet some of the people who were at the concert, usually the people who organized the concert and some of my musician colleagues. And invariably after the concert, certain questions are asked from me. What type of questions? If musicians ask the questions, they usually ask, what have you recorded lately? What are I going to record next? Sometimes they ask specific questions pertaining to the profession. How do you play this piece? Or what addition you use of the Bach suites? And so on. And other people, whom we refer to as civilians, music lovers, <laughs> they ask questions. How come you play the cello? <laughs> How old were you when you started playing the cello? What do you think is the right age for my children to start some string instrument to learn? Then they ask the question, how do you travel with that big thing? How do you get it into the plane? Do you buy a ticket for it? And they ask questions, how do you practice? How much time you have to practice? When do you do your practicing with all the traveling? Then, of course, since I have another profession, which is being professor of Indiana University, where I teach cello, but I also teach German institutions in Canadian institutions, they ask me, pedagogic questions or think that how can you combine these two? And how much time you give to your students if you play all these concerts traveling always in planes and what do your students do? And great many questions which are always the same regardless what country I find myself or what town I find myself. One day I was sitting at a concert and a colleague of mine was playing the cello. A man somewhat taller than I, somewhat older than I, and I saw this man sitting down with the cello and proceeding to perform during the evening. Suddenly it struck me, that, my goodness, what if I am not a cellist? How do I look at this whole thing? A grown man, serious looking man, making a living with holding this big fiddle between his knees. And it struck me that it must be 
strange for many, many people in the world that this whole profession has some, some kind of strange aspect to it, that why people do it. I mean, it's all right that if you go to a concert and see a symphony orchestra play, under people, somebody's conducting there, and something serious is happening. But this idea of one man sitting with the cello, why is he doing it? What is his purpose in doing it? And how can he dedicate his whole life to do this? Because it takes an immense amount of work and concentration. So I started wondering that, Maybe there are people in the world who have this question the same way as I do. And then it also struck me that the music was not the way it is today, usually. People didn't go into a concert hall of the size of 3,000 seats and bought their tickets and sat there, watched somebody perform, admired the person, and after the concert was over, that person left for the next town, and they never found out who that person is, what he thinks of beyond the fact that he just plays the instrument and plays marvelously maybe, you become obviously curious that what led him to this whole thing, what is he thinking while he plays, what does he do before he goes to the concert, what does he do after the concert. Now, these days, because of this machinery, on occasion we have a glimpse of the artists and what they think and who they are and what they are. But Actually, the intimacy and the interplay between the performer and the audience is completely lost. In the past, this is what happened. There was a beautiful home, and people came to that home. The hostess invited them, gave them something to drink, something to eat, and the musician performed. In most instances, the musician was even engaged by the house as being the, the musician of the house, of the princesses, or the uh, rich part of society. And these people knew as much as they wanted about that artist, because he was in their employment. Now, if they didn't care because he was a messy creature, then that was his <laughs> choice of existence. But we usually know about the people, composers like the Haydn's and the Mozart's and the others, who have been employed by the great homes, and when the home found that Thursday night or Saturday night we want to hear some music, the people were invited, came to the house, and the artist performed. And afterwards, if somebody wanted to ask any question from him, then this is what happened. Today, this is completely non-existent. So part of this totally improvised evening, the idea behind it is, so as to establish or maybe re-establish for an evening, the past. The artist speaks about what he thinks of music, what he thinks that people should know about his music and generally about music, play a little, explain how it's being done, and hopefully, as part of this evening, people who would like to ask questions that I omit or I did not think of answering, to ask these questions and I will try to answer it the best way I can. But regardless how informal how unplanned, how improvised this evening is. Whenever music happens in an evening, it has to have some kind of a beginning. Now, cellists, when they think of a beginning, they think of Bach and a prelude of a Bach suite. So if you allow me, then this is what I'm going to do before I go on with this improvised evening, to play a movement of a Bach suite a prelude. <coughs> uh, by the way, since it takes some time to unpack the cello, this is what it travels in. And because of this, it takes up a much larger size for the airplane regulations admit or permit. And that's why it does need a ticket to travel with me. but it only pays half fare. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, because of the uh, ticket, it's entitled to the drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, you notice something strange next to me. When I play concerts, the rule is, for the time being, that I never drink before concerts. That was also a motivation of mine to invent or try such an evening, that since we are in a private home, since we are speaking as well as 
on occasion playing. But I always wondered what would happen if I start <laughs> drinking. <laughs> Since I always have to wait after the concert to have open. So this is almost the after concert attitude. So therefore I'm entitled to a drink and smoke. <laughs> the feeling that this microphone might just get in my way, so I just move it a little bit. And I was told that I shouldn't speak too much while playing, so I try to refrain. But on the other hand, since we are as informal as it's supposed to be, if you allow me, I take my jacket off, which I cannot do either on concerts, except when the airplane ride results in a lost suitcase, and I don't have my concert suit on, and then I have to play in short sleeves. And sometimes I dream of having the... <laughs> this part, when one arrives to normal to a concert, takes place behind the scenes. And what is prepared, geared to the exact demands of the concert stage. Hopefully this is not the case now.
One of the questions people ask usually that how come that you play the cello? When did you start it and so on? Well, my story is very simple. I had two brothers and they played the violin. And mother was determined that, of course, all her three sons will have to play a musical instrument. Father didn't make enough money at the time, so there was no piano in the house. So what can a six years old play? There are already violins in the house, so he has to play something else. I was too young to play the clarinet or something, so cello was the choice of the violin teacher who decided that I should play the cello. So the cello, which about the size of, oh, about up to here, was bought. I had a sort of little chair, which I sat. And six weeks after I started playing the cello, my teacher that time, who was uh, teaching in a kind of a music school, which was combined with a uh, children's theater, decided that I should appear in public and play two little pieces that I was learning. Six weeks, mind you. Can you imagine the picture? So there I was, about that size. Strange as it may seem to have had long hair. <laughs> like Mozart, because that was the traditional thing at the time. And I sat down in front of an audience, children, on a Sunday afternoon, I played this. This children's theater functioned every Sunday. So, six weeks in a row, every Sunday I went out there and performed these two masterpieces. <laughs> As the weeks went by, it got worse and worse. <laughs> by the time the fifth week or the sixth week, something, something like this. <laughs> Mother got sick and decided that if I play so bad, it must be the teacher's fault, so <laughs> got a new teacher. And that new teacher was the teacher with whom I studied all my life by the name of Adolf Schiffer of the Franz Liszt Academy of Music. And things went on and on and on, and eventually I landed in Carnegie Hall and other places, but there were some few things in between that happened. And those few things, somewhere along the line, brought home the message that one of the most important things in musical activities and in musical life and a musician's life is teaching. But if you believe that something you learned and something you think is the right way of going about music, then it's a far more important duty to try to teach it to others to help them along their life than actually playing concerts. Because this is precisely what is that lack of interplay between audiences and musicians create that somehow it becomes a passing kind of an enterprise. You go to a concert and you applaud, you stand up, you cheer, and you had a marvelous experience, but still sort of goes by. On the other hand, from the musician's point of view, when you teach, the effect of your teaching may go through generations. If you happen to believe that what you are doing is right. The cello literature alone is limited to certain type of works. The first most important thing in the cello literature were the Bach solo sonatas, the six suites or sonatas, whatever we call it. And then, many, many years later, came a piece by Debussy who wrote a sonata with piano and cello, 
which became a new cornerstone in the development of the instrument. It brought new demands on the instrument, harmonics, blocking, pizzicatos, and all sorts of things. Then came a Hungarian composer who wrote the famous solo sonata, Zoltán Kodály, which again explored the instrument in a way that has not been done before. I wasn't thinking before, I wasn't planning on it, that maybe that would be a, the best demonstration if I would play at least one movement of that sonata and see what the cello can do these days. It requires the cello to be tuned differently, which means the two low strings are reduced half a step. So the G string becomes an F sharp, and the C string becomes a B natural, half step lower. This is the last movement of this sonata. Thank you. 